Welcome to Pacific Mammal Research's Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac-Man podcast. I'm Cindy. I'm Kat. And I'm Trevor. And this uh, episode is a marine mammal highlight. And um, it was exciting because we, we tried a different poll this time. We actually had two rounds of, actually, well, three rounds um, of choosing. So we, what were the, Trevor, what were the uh, animals again? We had Guadalupe fur seal. Guadalupe fur seal versus the poor gray seal that loses every time. Oh, poor gray. Eventually, we will do the gray seal. Right. We'll just we'll just usurp everybody and just do it. But yeah, okay. So the and the, the per seal one. Pacific white sided dolphin versus fin whale. So try to do something. A bunch of animals that were at least seen in Washington at some point. Not the gray seal, but just gave right. the poor gray seal another chance. But <laughs> it's so cool. There, you don't even know how gnarly those critters are. Just uh, saying. Yeah, it's you guys cool. are gonna be real upset that you didn't ask for it sooner. But that's okay. <laughs> It'll probably be in the next poll. <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, the Guadalupe fur seal versus the fin whale, right? That was the last. Mm -hmm. the Those last were one. the winners. And then the fin whale narrowly won. Narrowly won. So this was all our Instagram. It was tied. And so I went to our Facebook stories. And the two people that voted in the, in the Facebook stories uh, made the fin whale one, win. So that was uh, kind of exciting. Facebook you Facebook stories uh, beat the uh, the tie. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're going to be talking about the fin whale today. This is a very large animal in many ways that we'll discuss. Uh, and as uh, Trevor said, you know, that we've seen all those animals except for the gray seal, of course, uh, in the Salish Sea, and Kat will talk about that um, connection later. Um, but uh, Trevor was going to start us off with kind of where they are, what they look like, and what they look like is pretty cool. <laughs> So I've actually seen a fin whale in Washington before. That's, oh, that's right. You're lucky. So we thought it was, so it was a big humpback whale feeding party. Um, everyone knows humpbacks, but we were, there was a, you know, a minky here, here, here and there in the mix too. And then all of a sudden we saw the biggest minky whale we've ever seen in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a minky, it was a fin whale. That uh, one, especially because the minky whales are like the smallest. <laughs> 30 feet for the minkies. And this was granted, it was not a big, fin whale it was still a big animal but it was a juvenile um mm -hmm. and we were guessing it was probably like 50 feet but <laughs> a juvenile that's fine yeah, you know fin feet. whales get to 85 feet long so they're the lar second largest animal on the planet behind the classic blue whale and i don't know if it was the second largest animal ever i don't know if some, some dinosaur beats it but yeah so that's what i was because i was doing the blog and i was like i was going to say the second largest animal you know ever and then i was like wait a minute that might not be true <laughs> i don't that know i'm not sure about i haven't yeah. actually looked at that yet. The second largest There's, whale though we know yeah. that for our ivy some sauropod that's huge but right. <laughs> long neck dinosaurs for that um but anyway 85 feet long and i think that that was the maximum length that they've recorded and then the maximum weight they've had is 82 tons so 164,000 pounds but that's recorded <laughs> so there's probably bigger animals and 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 I would also like to point out like um 80 uh, how do you how do you how do you weigh a fin whale for comparison <laughs> yeah <laughs> for compar let's just take it out and just put it on a scale it's fine right a humpback is 50 feet long and 32 tons for reference that is so most people know humpbacks reason. you know <laughs> it's a big animal <laughs> Yeah, if you've ever seen a humpback, you're like, wow, that's pretty big, but that's nothing compared to <laughs> fin. Right. And I, uh, physically wise, they're your classic baleen whale shaped whale, essentially Torpedo. long and slender, but they're, the coloration is brownish gray to lighter gray on the top and sides and then lighter on the bottom, like your classic counter shading. Um, but one distinctive coloration with them is their jaws are differently colored on either side. So, so on the left lower jaw, it's darker versus white on the right. And it's, it's so weird. It's like asymmetric. So it's just yeah, like exactly. you don't normally see. They may be asymmetric, but still have the same shape, but just it's just not exactly the same, but not like completely different on each side of the animal. It's very weird. Right. And if you That's go true. to 
Do we know why, we know why that is? I don't know, but the tongue is the opposite. Yeah, that was the weirdest thing. Yeah, the tongue is, yeah. So it's like, right, like I guess, light on the left side and dark on the right side. And then even the baleen is different colors in, in certain parts of the mouth. I think so. I, I know that's the case for minkies at least, but I didn't see that. Yeah, before. I remember reading that. But so for, to answer Kat's question, they don't know. However, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit, but they, um, they think it might have something to do with aiding in their feeding. That's so, what I wondered. Oh, yeah. Okay. But, the, but, we'll they, but they, but they, it's, it's totally like, it could be that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so that's their, their best guess. So if you Got come it. across one in Washington somehow, super rare, there's only been like what, three cases in the last five years, six years? Something like that. Very, very um, rare. You know, everybody thought this, they're, I mean, yeah, we'll talk about a recent one, but everybody thought it was a minky, but it's actually a fin whale. Um, but the best way to figure it out is based on the blow. So mm -hmm. they'll have a tall towering blow, like the classic blow versus minkies don't really have one. Do you know how tall it can be? Tall. 18 to 20 feet. Yeah. What? Feet. That's like a more than a one house story. I know. <laughs> Wow. I'm actually like, at the 15 feet as well, but it's a big blow. It's just like their exhale is just like whoosh, crazy. So that's your best. I mean, granted, we really, really had juveniles here, so it's hard to tell, but the blow is probably the biggest distinct part. But they have that same curved dorsal fin, about a third or last third of the body, just like minkies, but surfacing. I love when, when they surface, it's like back, 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 dorsal fin. <laughs> that's kind of the same. Another way to figure out fin versus minky. Minky's like kind of the same. You know, comes up and then there's a the dorsal fin versus, like you said, back, 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 back. <laughs> wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> and they do fluke sometimes. Minkies don't, and they can ID fin whales that way, mm -hmm. classic fingerprint, but it's not, they don't fluke all the time. Yeah, they, they, I sure saw they did, they don't really, they occasionally do it, but it's not, not like humpbacks that fluke all the time. Right. And they, and by, and by fluke up, we mean they're, they take their tails all the way up into the air so you can see the underside when they dive. Yeah. Um, they are found in every ocean of the planet, not as frequently as they used to be, but I'm sure we'll talk about that some more. <laughs> I thought that was um, funny when I looked at the map, I was like, the whole thing is blue. Like, you know, yeah. they color in the they shade in the area and it's just like basically the whole entire globe. I'm like, yeah, they prefer, um, temperate to polar regions. So imagine like here, California to Alaska, I guess mm -hmm. would be a good range for the Pacific area. Um, they avoid the polar ice caps or there's constant ice, which makes sense because they can't really breathe. Um, <laughs> like they can't take like, like a small little hole in the ice to breathe. <laughs> right. So not big. exactly small, like an narwhal. <laughs> All right. But they are also, also found in tropical waters, but that's probably because they're going to the breeding grounds, which mm -hmm. who knows we don't about. know about. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I've seen one and I know there's been a few, but I would love to see an actual adult instead of a juvenile, which is still big, but still. Yeah, I would love to see that too. I mean, just the, I mean, I've been around humpbacks and had them right next to our boat and everything. And, and that is impressive enough. So to see something twice the size. And that's still not even the biggest animal. Right, exactly. Uh, I'm blue, I mean, the blue whale is on my bucket list. Like if I ever yeah. got to see a blue whale in reality, I would be beyond ecstatic, but they're probably not gonna show up in the Salish Sea. <laughs> Well, never, never, never it's true. Know. You never know. We've had fin whales and then belugas and uh, what Where's was it? the other odd one? We had a Guadalupe fur seal this year, so not Guadalupe exactly common seal. here. Rizzo's dolphins. Oh, the Rizzo's. That's right. Yep. Narwhal, Rizzo's, Guadalupe fur seal, fin we had whale. A sperm whale a few years ago. Yeah, the sperm whale that showed up. So, and then we had bottomless dolphins. We had common dolphins. Like there's Long some. Beach there's, dolphins. There's, yeah. you, you never know. I would never say never. <laughs> Because somebody will show up to be like, uh -huh, you're wrong on, a, on their own little journey right. around the world. Anywho, that's my stuff. Cool. All right. Well, I'll, I'll go right into then the behavior. And so that uh, your last part there about the breeding grounds goes into their migration routes. So um, basically, one of the other reasons why they're a little bit odd to see them in the Salish Sea is that they generally prefer deep ocean waters <laughs> far away from land. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we, we, there are a lot of gaps in our knowledge about their behavior and ecology, because they're, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. 
maybe a needle in like 500 haystacks. haystacks. I mean, the ocean is a big place. So um, it, that makes it difficult just to even find where they are in the first place. Um, but we do know that they, you know, they hang out in those deeper waters and they do undergo migrations just like all the other baleen whales. They go in the summer to the poles. I always have to think about this because I get it wrong or I switch it in my head. They go in the summer into the pole, it's colder waters to feed, and then they migrate to subtropical areas to, um, to breed. Um, but as Trevor was saying, we basically don't know where they breed. Like we know they do it in warmer places. And you would think with such a large giant animal that they wouldn't be that hard to find, <laughs> but they are. So um, I did see that the, they um, have uh, uh, whales in Alaska that, are, that they know to winter off of Mexico. Hmm. So, but, that, but I only saw that one place and then everybody else was like, we don't know where they breed. So <laughs> how they, I wonder how they track those individuals I don't know, and they and of course I couldn't find anything of like how you know, they just said that, that they did that, but they do. You can identify individuals, as Trevor was saying, with um, the uh, the flukes sometimes, but they don't do that that often. But you can um, use dorsal fin, nicks and notches, and also the shape. And I thought this was really cool that they use they they have like five or six, I think it was um, different shapes that the that they categorize, like we do with the porpoises. That there's <laughs> these, these stand, kind of standardized shapes that are apparent. So I thought that was really cool. Um, they also can use the blaze, which is the ear and eye stripes. So the coloration in that area, the saddle, which is on their, you know, on their back usually. Uh, and then the chevrons, which are these V-shaped coloration patterns on the back of their head. Mm -hmm. We're and starting to do that here with humpbacks too, with the side profiles a little bit. Oh, okay. um, well, yeah. Because there's a couple, like there's an unback named Ocean, for example, and it's just very clear propeller marks on the side. And oh, that's added okay. to their database. But there's others like uh, Big Mama is a common humpback. She has very clear dots here and there. Mm -hmm. and Interesting. Kind of well, like what the minky stuff is too. They minky research here does the same thing. Side profiles. Right. Yeah. They use pigmentation patterns kind of on the side versus their dorsal fins necessarily. Well, and there's a, um, uh, they've done bottlenose dolphins. They use the, um, the stripes basically that the, the pigmentation patterns on the side of the, by the mouth, um, the chin straps kind of thing. Uh, they use that for ID. Orcas do it. If you can't figure out the saddle patch, you use the eye patch, which the is eye super hard, but it's possible. Yeah. Well, and what's, that's what's really interesting is that there are so many more, like it's the classic saddle patch or dorsal fin. That's really what the, it, most ID has been done on. But now, as we're just doing more of this, we're realizing there are other parts of the body that you can use that do have these distinctive marks. Um, and when I was researching dolphins in the Bahamas, the bottlenose dolphins there, um, that you know they have the pigmentation pattern from the dark to the light across the side of the animal, and then there's these little curly cues, like it goes uh, where the dark kind of goes up into the light. And I was like, back in the day, I was like, I, I, bet, I wonder if those are unique to individuals. I wonder if we could use those for ID. And you and now there's so many different options that you can use and, and you could use those. Uh, it's just a matter of on the surface, you don't really see those. We got to see them underwater. Um, so that was why that was helpful. But uh, it's just really neat to be able to see how many, how many different ways you can, and, and pigmentation and, and patterns and stuff that you can use uh, to ID individuals, which is very cool. Um, so they socially, baleen whales generally are not very social at least uh, as far as we can tell. Although there is some research going into the idea of humpbacks to see if there are any long-term relationships, um, at least based on where they see the animals all the time. So that'll be really interesting to see that's being done through um, Happy Whale, right? Which is where you can send in photographs and have the humpbacks ID'd and matched from all over the place. Um, so, but, but for the most part, they do seem to be more solitary, but these guys seem to be a bit more social than other baleen whales. Uh, they are seen in groups of like two to seven, maybe up to 10, um, but they can be seen alone or in pairs. So like the ones that we've seen here have been by themselves. Um, they don't think that long-term bonds are likely, again, like, like most um, baleen whales. Um, but they have been documented in larger feeding aggregations of up to 100 animals in the Bering Sea. Wow. Uh, yeah, and, and that's when they were more plentiful, as Kat will talk about why they are less plentiful a little bit later. <laughs> um, but that, I mean, can you imagine, I mean, just seeing one, could you imagine seeing 100 fin whales that are like 85 feet, 80 something tons? Like, And just hearing the blows too. Oh my God. 
That would be crazy. Um, and as uh, Trevor mentioned, he said, you know, when he saw the fin whale here, he was, they were hanging out with humpback whales and minke whales and feeding. Uh, and that is also apparently fairly common. They uh, are often found interacting and often feeding with other um, marine mammals like humpback whales, minke whales, and even Atl Atlantic white-sided dolphins. So uh, they, they are the party animal. No, they're not the party animals. They're just the more socialites, I guess. <laughs> the larger baby. Fashionably late. Right. <laughs> They are very fancy. Um, so behaviorally, as we kind of discussed already, they are a bit cryptic. They they don't really spy hop, which is you know sticking their head up out of the water and having looking around with their eyes. They don't breach that often. Although I did see a picture of them breaching, and again, can you imagine an eighty ton animal breaching? I mean, <laughs> you would not want to be very close. No, just this that would be wild. Like how oh. loud it would. Oh, seriously, it would be like like a that that kind of a belly flop. Wow. And the energy that they use to do that too. Yeah. Well, and so that's the thing. That's probably why they don't do this because to be able to push yourself out of the water when you're that big is going to take a lot of energy and you need that energy to find food and whatnot. Um, and so they said they, they don't really fluke up that often. Uh, they, they keep a lower profile. Um, they are very fast. And I'm not going to tell you how fast because Kat is going to tell us that, but it's pretty impressive. So you really think of these guys as like these big torpedoes going through the water. <laughs> very cool. Um, so feeding wise, they are, work oh, I can never say this term, work wall, right? Right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Whales, which are your humpbacks your minkies and stuff they're the ones that have the grooves underneath like an accordion underneath their chin so that they will they either lunge or skim feed where they go up and they just take a whole bunch of water into their mouth their uh, chins expand greatly so they will have these big like pelican pouches below <laughs> below them uh, and they um, these guys will kind of roll on their sides with their mouths open sometimes uh, circling fish to corral them into like a bait ball and then gulp all the fish in the water or krill and then um, push the water out and then the prey gets stuck in the baleen. Um, and so this is why the asymmetrical coloration comes in because they always go, I think on the right side, I think they said that was always on the right. So it, that, that asymmetrical coloration may be, uh, I don't know, maybe it scares the fish. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, a, I, don't, I don't have a fish brain. Oh, maybe I do. I'm but, curious if there's uh, lefties out there, you know? Yeah. So kind of, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Because they're, I mean, I know like with stranding feed, strand feed dolphins, they usually go on one side, but it, I don't know if they all go on the same side or if they choose one. Well, gray whales tend to, I think it's, don't, this is not scientifically correct, I don't think, but there's, I want to say it's like around 90% go on one side, which is why mm -hmm. they're blind on one side, because they go through the mud. Oh, jeez. Um, but then there's a couple that'll go on the left side, so that might be like, I'm a lefty, you know, mm -hmm. not very right. many lefties in the world, but maybe that's the case here too. Yeah, and they wear down the baleen on that one side too. So they end up, you know, you can tell even if the animal's dead, you can tell that there's like the baleen right. on one side, way more yeah. worn on the other side. Yeah, so it's interesting. And there, there are cases of, of laterality in many different aspects of dolphin and whale behavior. So it's really interesting to see, like, think about why that occurs. And, you know, um, there's obviously, there's a reason why they are colored that way. So there, there has to be some driving force that has selected for animals that have that specific coloration. Um, but like, why, yeah, why is it the right or the left? Why is most of them being on the right-hand side for gray whales or whatever better? Um, I don't know. And maybe it's like humans where we have the majority of people are right-handed, but there are a small percentage that are left just from random mutations or whatever. <laughs> are you a lefty, Trevor? Yeah. yeah. So that's right. Uh, our, my son is a, is a lefty. Um, and both my grandparents are left-handed, although they were they were left-handed, but they were back in the day where you were forced to be right-handed. So, um, yeah, it was a struggle yeah. in college when all the desks are right-handed. Oh yeah, yeah. well, like all those things you think about. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then and then it's it's bad when you're the right-handed person and you get the left-handed desk because they do they'll put those periodically like through the uh, you know in the in the desk and stuff, and you're like, oh, oh, oh wait a minute. For tests, I had to message Request. the professors like, hey, can I have a left-handed desk for the love of God, please? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, and the thing is they didn't, they put it just like scattered throughout. So it, it, you would have to like know exactly where that seat was to go get it. And other people would have to know to not take that seat. Yeah. It's, it's hard being a lefty. Yeah. <laughs> Except for us out here. <laughs> Um, so what they eat, they eat 
planktonic crustaceans, which are krill and copepods, which I always find hard to, to remember that they're crustaceans, because when you think of crustaceans, you think of like crab and lobster and stuff, but they are, yeah, but these are little tiny ones that are planktonic. Um, and uh, again, some of the largest animals, the blue whale and, and the fin whale eat this, one of the smallest creatures on the planet. And, and they also eat small schooling fish like herring, capelin, and sand lance, things like that. But they have to eat up to two tons daily. <laughs> so, and, and imagine how, how many two tons of a, a small planktonic organism is. It's well, this thing. So, like, again, we'll get into this in a little bit, but just think about that in relation to how much these guys need to depend on certain foraging spots, mm -hmm. right? Sure that they have this amount of prey for themselves on a regular basis. Like, that's a pretty big deal. It's huge. And it always blows my mind. This is kind of like the fact that space never ends to me in my brain, but like, how, how is there that much food? And, yep. and we're already coming down to the fact that we, you know, there's less and less and less, but just in the, how, how, how is there that much? And historically to too, when we had so many fin whales and that's just fin whales too, who compete with blue whales, who compete with this, who compete with this, who compete with this. So exactly. Like, how is it that much that there's still enough for them and us? I mean, again, we're having issues with that now, but like you said, back in the day, like, oh my God, it's just mind boggling. Um, so they can dive. Um, I saw two different estimates, the max of being a thousand feet or the max being 1800 feet. So somewhere in between there, uh, they can dive pretty deep. Um, and they'll, you know, you can usually tell because they'll, they'll, they'll breathe about four or five, six, seven, eight times and then dive down Which for is about weird five that they would 15 dive. minutes. It's weird that they would dive that deep considering most of the food is probably near the surface in the photic zone. It, yeah, that's true. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that, I, I would think that's why they don't really dive for that long, right? Yeah. They're not, they don't need to be deep divers, um, but maybe they have parties down there. I don't know. <laughs> Didn't know parties. <laughs> All right, speaking of parties, uh, mating again, um, to round off our thing, um, mating happens in the winter uh, usually. And of course, this is always the case since we, these are animals are found in the Northern and Southern hemisphere. Mating occurs in the winter, which is December to February in the Northern Hemisphere, and then May through July in the Southern Hemisphere, which always also breaks my mind because thinking of like snow in July is just weird because I live in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> um, but not, not, not much else is known about their behavior because uh, again, we don't really even know where they, uh, where they give birth and everything. So uh, we do know that sexual maturity occurs between six to 10 for males and seven to 12 for females. Females are pregnant for about a year, 11 to 12 months. Um, they give birth in the midwinter to a 14 to 20 foot calf that can weigh up to two tons. Small. And as a mother, I just think of giving birth to that and it, 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 it hurts my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously they're big too. So it's all per, per, you know, ratios, but still that's a, that's a big baby, very big baby. Um, they live, they nurse for about six to eight months and they give birth every two to three years. Um, there have been some uh, instances of fin whales mating with other species outside of themselves. And then I'm going to leave that for cat. That's just a little teaser for you guys. Um, but you can probably imagine who it might be <laughs> based on what we've been talking about. Beluga. Um, Beluga. Hmm? Beluga. Beluga. <laughs> that cool. was also, just this is going to test who listens to the podcast all the time, because I'm pretty sure we've already talked about this on maybe one or two other podcasts. So there's probably yeah. some out there that are did. like, I know, I know. So right. we'll get there. You talked about <laughs> it already. I know, I know, I know. Um, so yeah, so that is what I got, because Kat's also going to talk about how long they live, which is pretty impressive as well. There, like I said, there are many impressive things about this animal. So this, this week, Kat has not just the threats, she actually does have some really cool fun facts. I mean, she always does, but like, it was a little bit easier, I think, to find these ones than it was one of the other animals that we, tried, not doom and doom. That we knew like nothing about. <laughs> so with that, we will take a quick break and Kat will be back with the threats and fun facts. And we're back. And so Kat's gonna start us off with the threats and then end with the fun facts like we always do. Yeah. It's always so, better to end with the fun facts. Right, we'll, we'll end on a high, we try. Right. <laughs> um, sometimes it's easier than other times. 
So I'm actually going to start off just talking a little bit about the status of, um, of these guys in the world at this point. So as we talked about, they, we had a lot more fin whales back in the day, um, and they were pretty severely hunted. So if you know anything about the whaling industry, um, typically what happened was that larger whales got hunted out first. Um, and we had a lot more of them back in the day. Um, and unfortunately for fin whales, because they were very prevalent, they were also ones that were picked off by whalers substantially. Um, and obviously the bigger the whale, the bigger the payout. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for the whalers. So they were substantially hunted um, back in the whaling days. Thankfully, not so much anymore, um, but they are still listed by the IUCN as endangered. Um, they're also listed under the Endangered Species Act as endangered, and they're listed by the Marine Mammal Protection Act as depleted. Um, and basically what that means is that this animal is in danger of extinction throughout much or all of its range. So just to kind of give you a context for what that actually means. Which um, is the in all the oceans in the world. <laughs> right. And like you already said, Cindy, because we don't know much about these populations, it's really difficult to know how endangered they are. And I'll get to more of that in just a second. Yeah. Um, and so here in the U.S., we divide fin whales into four different stocks. So we have the California, Oregon, Washington stock. Um, we have the Hawaii stock. We have the Alaska stock, which is basically the Northeast Pacific um, and the Western North Atlantic stock. Um, and so, like I said, they actually noted on the NOAA website that we know a lot more about certain populations of fin whales than other ones. Well, and so that's interesting that we have three different stocks on the Pacific coast, but they only have one stock on the Western Atlantic, which is and that's just because, Obviously, this is only for the U.S. We're not talking right. about the whole, yeah. but um, yeah. ironically, the North Atlantic is the one that has a lot of reliable data, whereas the Pacific stocks don't have much. And I think that's probably to do with shipping traffic mm. that actually the North Atlantic shipping routes, um, and we'll get to that in the threats because that's mm -hmm. a big threat, yep. um, but they probably are actually encountering fin whales a lot more consistently than they mm. would be fairly out here, Interesting. Uh, potentially. So I thought that was just really interesting to note. And also um, because they are listed as depleted, NOAA actually does have an active conservation and management scheme in place for fin whales. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're interested in that, um, I'll actually, I'll send it to you, Cindy, so we can link it down in the show notes. Okay, but there perfect. is actually a NOAA fin whale recovery plan, which is pretty cool, cool. where they actually do all the different efforts that they're Doing. undertaking to try to help to conserve and protect these animals further, which is pretty cool. neat. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool to include. So speaking of threats, let's get through this. <laughs> um, so like I already said, ship strikes is actually a major one for fin whales. Um, and they are actually, which kind of blew me away, I didn't realize it was quite this bad, but they are the second most vulnerable species to ship strikes after the North Atlantic right whale. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I I not confirmed, but I'm pretty sure the fin whale I saw was dead the next week Ooh. because of the ship strike. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, the one yeah, time yeah. we get one. Right. Well, it's it's so congested here too. It's you're just yeah. and the yeah. That's interesting though that that the, I mean, I would assume that the larger the whale, the the more the the more likely you are to get hit by a larger ship. I mean, just because you're bigger. So I would have assumed that the blue whale would have been on there, but and I know the North Atlantic right whale has a huge problem, but that probably has something not less to do with size and more to do with where where they are in close to the shipping lanes and stuff like that. So I wonder if that has something to do with it, that the fin whales, even though they're not as quote unquote coastal as the North Atlantic right whales are to some degree, um, if they just are in those shipping lanes more than say blue whales yeah. are. Well, I remember, answer, sorry, go ahead. Oh, the answer is yes. Okay, good. The <laughs> answer is yes to that. And also with the blue whales, part of the reason that we don't see quite as many of them involved in ship strikes is that there's also just a lot fewer of them so you don't have the opportunity quite as much because they're not they're not hanging out in the the, the busiest shipping lanes necessarily right. but even when they are if there's only one hanging out there versus 10 or 100. 20 right. or 100 you're less likely to get hit by a ship That's so um, i mean the other obviously unfortunate part about this is that shipping is just increasing exponentially yeah. um, and shipping routes are increasing. Um, the more that the Arctic and polar regions break up and have less consistent sea ice, the more shipping routes are expanding up into polar regions. Um, so this is really one of the major threats facing fin whales is just that their ship strike likelihood is mm -hmm. increasing substantially. 
And I think it's a good point to, to point out there that, that it has to do with their behavior as well as their ecology, right? So where they're feeding and then the behavior that there are more of them together in groups rather than a single blue whale, both of those go into whether they are going to be more likely to get hit by ships. Um, and I, 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 since we're talking about ship strikes, I just want to plug something really quick. I'm reading this book. If it'll, oh, it won't come up. Dang it. Oh, there it is. We, oh, there. Oh, I got it. Uh, it's Michael J. Moore's We Are Whalers. Um, and it talks, it's mainly concerning the North Atlantic right whale because there, that is such a big issue. But it goes into talking, you know, comparing ship vessel strikes versus, you know, traditional whaling. Like, which one, you know, like, what is more of a risk for them now? And it goes into a lot of, it, it's, he's a veterinarian and a marine mammal um, uh, scientist and it's, it's very well written. Um, so it just talks a lot about that particular thing about the ship strikes and what that means to the animals and, uh, and entanglement as well. So uh, it's a great book. I'll put the link to that as well. Perfect. Yeah, I was going to say, and actually that's a perfect segue into the next threat, which is entanglement. Awesome. Um, <laughs> So they are also, again, interestingly, similar to the North Atlantic right whale, they are also very susceptible to entanglement in fishing gear. And again, this is likely to do with where they're hanging out. Um, and these guys are actually endangered by lots of different types of gear. So a lot of times when we talk about an animal's susceptibility to entanglement, it's often like a specific type of gear that they're most likely to get caught up in. Right. And again, similar to the North Atlantic right whale, these guys are basically susceptible to anything that's in the water. Um, and again, partly because they're going so fast, um, it might be a little large. It's difficult to maneuver around um, lines in the water, but any, you know, any kind of trap, pot, gill net, line fisheries, I mean, anything that's in there, they could potentially get stuck on. Um, and again, as we've discussed before, they either will swim off with the gear attached to them and that will basically slow them down over time and will lead to fatigue and less ability to forage, potentially impact their reproductive capabilities. Yeah. Um, kind of wear them down that way, or they can actually get wrapped up in the gear, get anchored to a spot and pulled down, right? Either pulled down and not be able to breathe, or they just, they either die from their injuries or they just are tethered there and, and can't get food and slowly die. So it's pretty horrific any way you look at it. Yeah. And that's uh, one of the big parts of that, of that book is talking about the entanglement and the long-term health and what these animals are suffering the average entanglement for north atlantic right whale was 10 months that's the average oh. yeah for how long they they just keep oh, going I with that stuff on them yeah oh. and um so it's a really it's a really big problem and this is a good uh, link to our podcast from a couple weeks ago where we talked with uh, our friend from smelts who is developing fishing gear that does not have ropes and buoys um it's uh, ropeless fishing gear so that fishermen can fish without having these lines in, the, in, in it that catch these North Atlantic right whales and fin whales and many other creatures. Yeah. So check that out if you didn't listen to it last week, <laughs> last episode. Yeah. Um, so the next one, which kind of leads off of the other two is ocean noise. So again, this is one that we often bring up when, especially when we're talking about the larger whales. Um, but basically with the increasing noise in the world's oceans, most of which is driven by that increasing ship traffic and increasing coastal development and just, you know, offshore development. Um, renewables actually is a potential concern around this because if you are pile driving in the ocean, that mm -hmm. noise spreads. Um, so again, it's that management mitigation of like, how do we live more sustainably without damaging what's already there? Um, so, I mean, again, we've talked about this before, but this can impact fin whale normal behavior patterns. So if there is a consistent amount of noise, they might avoid areas. Um, and if that's a specific spot where they go to forage or breed, that's a huge problem. Um, it can also inhibit their communication um, and uh, actively repel them from specific areas as well at times. Um, and they have really low vocalizations, so they correct. can travel pretty far. So. Right. And the problem okay. with a lot of the ship noise is that quite a lot of ship noise is ship noise is tricky because it goes over all the different frequency ranges and there's like, mm -hmm. you know, high frequency, higher frequency ship noise and lower frequency ship noise. But when you're talking about the larger shipping lanes, you are looking at that lower frequency sound right. consistently. Time. So that's, again, that's actually quite a problem when you're talking about these animals communicating with one another over large distances that's what low, low frequency vocalizations are, are designed for, right. but they might be attenuated a lot faster if you're, if you're dealing with that interference in the airwaves. Or, or, or masked completely, if it just covers right. that, 
that thing and they they can they can communicate some like hundreds of kilometers it's crazy oh, I'll get oh sorry that's a problem. <laughs> it's yes. very long so it's you know and you're trying to reach someone that far away and it gets cut off right yeah. um that does create a problem um and then the final major threat is again as pretty much all other marine mammals is um, and we've already referenced this a little bit in relation to, for example, the shipping lanes opening up more consistently in the polar waters. That has a pretty big impact for these guys as well. So you have some of those kind of indirect effects. Um, but obviously climate change can impact where their prey are found. So that's going to, especially now that they actually eat. <laughs> right. um, you know, again, like I said, if you, if you remove that prey patch or if you move it somewhere else and they now don't know where to find it, that's a huge ramification if you're trying to eat 2000 pounds of food a day. And even if they do eventually find it, how much energy did they put into finding it and do they have the ability to make that up? Right, because then you're talking about having to increase the amount of energy you're consuming in order to right. offset that. So it's, it actually, if you play it out, it actually can become quite a big problem. And then there's obviously the, the more direct oceanographic impacts as well. So warming sea, sur sea surface temperatures, um, acidification, all that kind of thing that will also directly impact their own physiology and their own well-being. So right. yeah, these guys are dealing with a lot. <laughs> well, like I said, to have that much, you know, the, to ha have the energy to move that large of an animal and do that, you have to have that. And so just the, it's interesting because there's some some new foraging strategies that are popping up in marine mammal species like uh, humpback whales and um, uh, Eden's whale uh, that were doing that that trap feeding where they just sit at the surface and they create this like little vortex and the fish to like just jump in the mouth and then they go like that. So it's like uh, are certain species going to be able to develop these new less energetic ways of feeding that will allow them to survive even if there's you know fewer fewer prey, but not all species are going to be able to do that. Like will fin whales be able to adjust that? Well, I don't know. So yeah. A really good point mm -hmm. and also on what you're foraging on you know right. if you can what you're foraging on will dictate how you can forage for it you know exactly yeah that's a good point though um so with that okay we can fun find facts, fun facts, fun facts. <laughs> <laughs> i like how we're all so excited for the fun facts for these guys it's awesome um okay so first of all we'll put you out of your misery because i know you've all been wanting to know how fast they go so they are the fastest whale in the ocean, which I actually, I had to triple check because I'm like, sometimes you see that on different websites and you're yeah. like, yeah, look, really? Um, they can go up to 23 miles an hour, which is 37 kilometers an hour. That's bad. And then is, bursts, right? Not, not, not sustained scene. Yeah. And it's also, again, it's the up to, so that's the, right. the upper that's range nice. of that, right? Um, and they can live for up to 80 to 90 years. I saw somewhere that there was one that was 111. Or yeah. I Thing where it, again this is where because we know so little about their yeah. actual life history, we don't really know what their average lifespan is but they you know it's possible I think because in ones up into the hundreds they're kind of like oh it's probably somewhere around 80 to 90 if they're doing right. okay right um pretty cool that's impressive um, and then yeah like cindy mentioned they, they can also produce calls that can be heard over hundreds of kilometers um so again kind of ties back into why it's so important for these guys and especially if you think about it like even though they are more social than some of the other baleen whales, it it's still like they don't necessarily travel together all the time. So right. they they're typically they are going to be more spread out and therefore need to communicate with individuals who are far away. They're not necessarily going to be able to spy hop and say like, "Hey, there's my friend over there," and you know. So I mean, it, like, it hey, is, dude, we're gonna meet up down in in Mexico. Like, what, what's what's your timing? Where are you? What's going on? <laughs> come over, come over party, have you get over? <laughs> It's just, it's just um, mind boggling to be able to communicate over that long of a distance, like that they would get that information and be able to use it. And it's, and, and then like, what, what are they communicating? What right. are you saying? Right. Yeah. That's why acoustics are so cool. It is very cool. Um, okay. And then you guys know that I love doing the name stuff. So oh, first yes. of all, there's some fun ones with this one. Obviously fin whale, we've kind of already talked about why it's a fin whale. Um, but back in the day that was actually very important so they they are named fin whale because of their very distinctive fin on their on the back of their um on the back of their back on the back, <laughs> on, the on, the back on the door on the back <laughs> of their uh, place but so i saw that but i was like why is it that much more distinctive than a minky or a humpback like they also have i don't but if this was the first one that they saw that had it that was that distinctive and that specific because okay. i mean okay if, then yeah 
Who knows, maybe, maybe minkies were just salty fin whales back in the day anyway. Yeah, right. that's true. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah, they all could have been like, those are fin whales. And then then they figured it out. Yeah. Hmm. So again, typically those kinds of names when they're very generalized like that is because they were the first one observed consistently right. had that particular marking word, I guess, identification this feature. One, yeah. Or wh whoever it was that saw it first was like, that's way more distinctive than these other ones I see. <laughs> exactly. Objective. Um, they were also known kind of, again, more traditionally with the whaling um, crews, they were also known as finback whales or herring whales. Oh, because they feed on herring, yeah. Right. So then they would be found consistently around those bait balls too. Right. And the Latin name is where it gets really fun. So the Latin name is Balenoptera physalis. So Balenoptera, we've talked about before, it means winged whale. And physalis actually means blowpipe, and it refers to their blowhole. Blowpipe? How cool is that? That's funny. Is it because of the blow, the blow is so big or like just? Well, I think so, because it was just such a tall, yeah. you know, very unique, like like Trevor said, like that's one of the identifying features of whether it's a fin whale. Right, that's true. Huh. So okay. I thought that was cool. Um, and then leading off of that, in 2019, there was actually a new subspecies of fin whale that was mm -hmm. um, classified in the Northern Pacific Ocean. And because we're already talking about Latin names, this one's Latin name is Balenoptera physalis villifera. I think I'm saying that correctly, which means carrying a sail in Latin. Which I thought was cool. I thought that was very elegant. Mm -hmm. um, oh, they're very elegant whales. I know, right? That's true, they are. Um, so this subspecies, they determine based on genetics. Um, and they actually found when they were doing some of these genetic studies that there was a lot more variation genetically between different populations than they were anticipating. Mm. And they could actually, even within, say, for example, the Pacific Ocean, they could actually distinguish between different populations genetically within the Pacific Ocean. So it's, again, the reason this matters is that this is a huge knock-on impact for conservation and management efforts. Because if you're, it's, it's, we always use the example of the Southern resident killer whales here in Washington, but if you know that a particular population is not interbreeding with other like outsources basically right. that, that population. population is isolated right that means that you have to make more effort to conserve that population otherwise you're going to lose a whole genetic line um so yeah pretty interesting um and they found that when they were sampling from the atlantic ocean and the pacific ocean um that those two populations have been separated for like hundreds of thousands okay. of years yeah so it's not just like oh they kind of like pop down around the coast of mexico and like go back and right. forth Maine and Washington which is interesting because there's no there's no barriers and if they're if they're around in all the oceans like why don't they why why did they not go across what's the reason it's there it's true there's not barriers but that's a huge distance to travel well yeah but they're found in like every single ocean and it the might planet. be like imagine the equator they don't go quite to the equator they don't go quite to the equator yeah. You know, it's kind so, of like Hawaii with the humpbacks. There's like some kind of little barrier section that's like, yeah. oh, that's where we're here. It's warm. Why keep on going? You know, right. yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, so apparently, according to NOAA, that about 14 to 18,000 North Pacific fin whales will be impacted by this new subspecies classification. Okay. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. And then finally, as we teased you before, hybridization. So again, if you've listened to our previous podcast, you probably already know this, but they hybridize with blue whales, which is just the coolest yeah. And they've pretty much only ever observed that it's a male fin whale mating with a female blue whale or another or a female hybrid. So the, they've actually been able to determine now that the hybrids are viable, which means that they can reproduce. <gasps> oh, see, because with the last thing I saw that they, they thought that they weren't they weren't um, viable. I thought they, were, they weren't oh, yeah. fertile. They've mm -hmm. on multiple examples of pregnant females, um, pregnant female Birds. hybrid, mm. not all actually come to term and a lot of these animals they found dead and when they did the necropsy they found a, a growing a fetus, fetus. right but the fact that the hybrids themselves can reproduce is a huge deal because for again like you said for a long time we thought they weren't viable right um, well it makes sense they, too that it's the that they mate with the male the, it's still the male fin whales mating with the female hybrids because of the if the hybrids are with the blue whale mother they're more likely to be behaviorally more blue whale-ish for lack of a better way of saying it so that it, that it would make sense that that would continue in that kind of dichotomy of male and female. Right. And they still, because obviously it's a little bit harder to determine a male's fert fertility versus a female's because they can't grow a baby. Um, <laughs> so they actually know if male hybrids are viable um, right. to, to 
not, they have not been able to confirm that yet. But yeah. I thought it was where there was a couple other, so, I mean, obviously the main, like, why do we think that it's typically the male fin whales mating with a female blue whale or hybrid? So, I mean, basic mechanics is the most obvious answer that blue whale, in order to carry a blue whale sized baby in a fin whale body, that's going to be, be common. And it might, it might actually not be feasible for the female. So again, this could happen, but how often it's actually goes to full term is well, unknown. Yeah. And then it has to do too the male, the, I mean, the size of males versus the size of female, just in the, in the fact of, of, of mating, maybe they just don't fit as well together. Correct. Yep. Yeah. So there's, that's kind of the, the, Thought the traditional it. assumption that this is likely just a matter of mechanics and, and mm-hmm. viability, the, the baby being able to go full term. Um, however, maybe the fin whales are just more frisky. <laughs> also, right. So we see that between dolls and harbor porpoise, right? right? When they have is the, the harbor porpoise males are extremely frisky. And so yes, they, they will they, typically it's a male harbor porpoise with a female doll's porpoise because the right. harbor porpoise is quicker and a lot friskier. <laughs> um, but there's also another theory apparently recently that um, there's it could just be that female blue whales are actually not encountering mates. And so they're basically oh. male fin whales because they're like, hey, look, they're I'm not fine. <laughs> right, you're close enough. Get over here and let's just make this thing happen because I need to, I need yeah. to perpetuate. I mean, the drive to reproduce, I mean, that's what we're here to do is to pass on your genes and you will do that however you can. If you can't find your own, you'll find somebody that's similar enough. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, that's, again, we don't know, but they're, those are kind of the two main theories at the moment. Um, And what's also interesting about this is that obviously it's very exciting, but it does also then mean that you are effectively diluting populations. So this is mostly a problem for the blue whales because they are more endangered than the fin whales at this point. Um, But if you, especially because we now know that hybrids can carry a fetus to full term and reproduce, if you are then having hybrids basically back crossing into the population, you're diluting the blue whale genetics. Right. um in wheel genetics basically so it just begs the question of like how long will that take to then get to a point where we actually don't have, have a difference tr- whales anymore right. um also the other thing which was very interesting which hadn't occurred to me just upon reading it was that the more you have these hybrid animals in the population especially if they're hanging out with other blue whales you don't know that they're not a blue whale necessarily. So you're also then the numbers, the counts of blue whales could actually right. get drastically inflated when genetically they're actually not a true blue whale. Right. Um, so again, just in terms of management and population structures, our assumption of how many blue whales there are could actually be inflated Much based lower. on the population. Right. Which again, just has those knock-on impacts for conservation. So kind of interesting to think. Complicated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, And then of course, like Trevor said, we were, so we're recording this in February of 2022 Mm -hmm. and we were lucky enough to have a fin whale here in the Puget Sound in January. Pretty wild. So yeah, like you said, they basically, everyone thought it was a minky. And I did. I was like, that's a minky. minky. Literally, if you're familiar with this area at all, it was hanging out like off the coast of Seattle, like near Golden Garden. It was right and the other the other fin whale was farther north and, and that just makes more sense it's just more open and it's closer to the inlet you know like the Strait of Ponte Fuca where you come in like this guy went all the way like there's no way a fin whale is down in Puget Sound oh oops, sorry just just kidding <laughs> it was also about a hundred feet offshore of West yeah. Beach by Deception Pass so that's crazy for the locals hung- if you go to Orca Network you can see the video on there yeah yeah and then I hung out for like a whole week and we yeah. have no idea like why it was here and then it just disappeared but he's like thanks so long thanks for all the fish (laughs) yeah Yeah. so again you said never say never and we're getting some some weird and crazy stuff happening around here with animals stopping down and checking it out and well and then also the the, i think all all the ones that we've had here have been juveniles so it's kind of like well it's just these 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 youngsters who don't know what's going on or where they're supposed to be and they're just off on an adventure exploring (laughs) exploring Exploring. that's right (laughs) But yeah, but it, it, real- it is very cool. It's a great place to to be right now because there's just so many crazy things going on. And there's, you know, sea otters are popping up different places and there's so many crazy things happening. So pretty it's incredible. Cool. Yeah. Yep. So, so for anybody cool. who got to see that fin whale, I'm jealous. <laughs> I only get yeah. to see videos. 
there was a picture, I think it was on Orca Network, and there was a picture of literally like the beach at Golden Gardens, and it was taken from the water looking back to the beach, and the fan wheel's like, just right here. I'm like, oh, oh. I'm so cold. Just wanted to see what this coast was all about. Like, I've been hearing about it for so long, but uh, you know, I just wanted to compare it to my ocean habitat. <laughs> Super cool. Very cool. All right. Well, I think that uh, sums it up for the fin whale. Uh, that was a fun episode. There's lots of cool stuff about these guys, even though we still have lots to learn about them. Um, so keep your eye on the research around that. I'm sure there will be more and more as, as hopefully we are able to get out and see and find them as similar to the blue whale, right? <laughs> find that needle in the haystack and try to figure out what's going on. But it's exciting research. Um, so that will do it for this episode. Next time, I believe we will have another interview. Uh, and then after that, I think we're going to get back to our uh, journal reviews for a little bit. But um, that will be a very cool interview. I won't tell you who it is, um, just because I want to keep it a secret. <laughs> but you'll find out soon. Uh, it's about rescue and re rehabilitation. I'll tell you that much. Um, so that will be fun for uh, next episode. And of course, follow us on Instagram and Facebook. And uh, next month, we will have another poll. Uh, maybe the same way we did it this time, maybe different. Maybe we'll have the gray whale again and see if it can win. Who knows? Uh, so keep an eye on Instagram and, and Facebook stories to uh, vote in that poll to see who we do next. Um, and check out our website because we do have merch. We have t-shirts and hats and uh, stuffed animals and all sorts of stuff. Um, so and all that funds from that go back to our research and being able to produce podcasts like this. So, uh, and you can also support the podcast on Anchor. So you can go to support us and that money also is super helpful in helping us continue to do what we do. So if you can reach out and do that. Uh, and if you have any suggestions, of course you can also email us uh, or reach us on social media. Um, we are always open to anything that you guys want to hear about, you would like to discuss. So we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P A C M A M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks. <laughs>